Children of Genocide, Five Who Survived, is a co-production of World Without Genocide and TPT's Minnesota Channel. Additional funding is provided by Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, STAND, University of Minnesota, Minnesota Interfaith Darfur Coalition, and Diversity Integration Office, Hamlin University, St. Paul, Minnesota. After the Holocaust, the world said never again. Never again would people sit idly by while innocent people were exterminated based only on their race, religion, ethnicity, or national origin. But those words never again have come to mean over and over again. Survivors from most of the world's horrific conflicts live in our community. We have several here today who were children or young adults living normal lives when genocides happened in their countries, in their towns, in their villages, and affected their families and their own lives forever. Holocaust survivors who are alive today were young children during that catastrophe. Soon there will be almost nobody left to bear witness to that tragedy. Fred Amram is Jewish. He fled with his family from Hitler's Germany. The Gestapo came regularly. Whenever the Gestapo came, my father was gone. Um, we found out later, or I found out later as an adult, that he had ways of knowing. And I don't, still don't know the ways of knowing that he had, but he would disappear to a... Uh, Christian family in, in this apartment building. We lived on, on the fourth floor. He would go downstairs. I don't know how far downstairs or which apartment he visited, but they would hide him under a bed. We are home for thousands of Cambodian refugees where a genocide exterminated nearly a third of the Cambodian population in the 1970s. Bunkin Chun, wanted to study medicine and become a doctor in Cambodia. Instead, he spent nearly a decade narrowly escaping death from the Khmer Rouge government. When the Khmer Rouge took over, you can hear the sound of hatred. Yeah. That's all over. So they treat us like prisoner of war, or they call us new people because new people are the group of people that don't join the revolution, don't fight with them. And that's the time they probably punish us. We have a large Bosnian community, Serbs, Croats, and Muslims, who came after that genocide in Europe in the 1990s, another European tragedy half a century after the Holocaust. Dragana Vidovic was 10 years old when war broke out in Bosnia. Her Serb town was attacked, and her life was changed forever. But I was surprised that it actually happened, that, um, that somebody orchestrated something like that in a country that's smaller than Minnesota, where we all know each other. Uh, and I say surprised just because I didn't believe that, there, that there's that much evil in my country. But then um, when you try to explain it and look back in history, you just see that this was kind of almost coming up or it, it's going to happen because these people were uh, fighting and having disagreements through the whole uh, time in their histories. People came here from Rwanda, survivors of the genocide in 1994, when more than 800,000 people were killed in 100 days, the length of a school semester. Alice Tuzla was nine years old when Rwanda's genocide destroyed her family. When it got to us now, it's just everybody changed. Neighbors became your enemy. Um, families became... Those who knew you were the ones that attacked you. Um, you know, being attacked at all times, having to sleep in abandoned house and so on, to 
you know, to survive the next day. You, it's almost we were on a, my emotions. I remember. I can't speak for everybody. It's almost you just live to hope you can live another minute because you don't know what the other hour holds. And there are refugees from Sudan, where the first genocide of the 21st century is happening now. Augustino Mayai, at age eight, was tending cattle in Sudan, and he had to flee on foot. He walked almost a thousand miles, ultimately finding safety across Eastern Africa in a refugee camp in Kenya, where he spent the next 10 years of his childhood. The conflict started when I was two. Uh, it did not intensify until when I was about seven, eight. And as a result, I had to leave and walked for nearly a thousand miles to get to the safer side of area where the U.S. government finally came to bring us to the U.S. What happens to children when their lives are torn apart by genocide? What is the impact as they become adults? Since then, I live off of a survival mode at all times. Um, it's as though I can't fully relax because I feel anything can happen at any time. What was your life look like before the genocide? My life before the war was luxury. Before the war, it was, it was great. Um, we had... Uh, peaceful environment. We had food available. There was my mother and my father. I'm an only child. Uh, Uncle Max visited regularly from Hamburg. I'm the youngest son in the family, and we have five. I have three brothers and one sister. Prior to that, I was a little kid um, going to school. Um, everything was pretty well organized. My dad had a job. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, my father and Uncle Max were in business together. They sold dry goods on the road. They were peddlers, so to speak. Grew up in pretty much a mansion, per se. Um, big house, a lot of siblings, maids. Living at home together in a family, it's, it's wonderful. We talk, and especially I remember that uh, when we eat supper, we ate together. Somehow things were comparatively uh, better before the conflict. Our life was pretty normal. What happened to you? When the Khmer Rouge came, they were thought that, well, it's time, the war is over. So they are trying to go back home to get family together and start new life. But as soon as the Khmer Rouge came, they just forced everybody to leave town. If you refuse to leave, they would throw the grenade into your house, into your place. And that's, that's the end. We heard a parade. And Uncle Max, who was the family tease, said that um, it was a parade in my honor. And so we all rushed out on the balcony uh, to look. And there was indeed a parade with the, the, the musical instruments and the khaki uniforms and the soldiers with their leather boots. And then there was a large black car, and in the back standing was a man with a mustache, uh, dark hair. Just as they came under our balcony, he raised his arm at a 45-degree angle and said, Heil Hitler. And with that, all of the military men in the parade shouted, Heil Hitler. And the man under the balcony was Adolf Hitler. From 92 to 93, we were kind of cut off uh, from the rest of the country. We didn't have food. Uh, Nothing was really getting to my part of Bosnia. Uh, no food supplies, no um, medicine and stuff like that. And my city was being uh, bombed from another city next to us. So I was well aware that there is war action going on and happening and that our army is bombing um, 
cities and that uh, another army is bombing our cities um, because I was that from 92 to 93 school didn't stop so we would used to go to school and I just the idea this comes to me so many, back to me so many times that my mother would send me to school knowing that a grenade can be sent and that I might not come home alive. We, we knew that international community is outraged by what's happening for so long. I was aware as a kid of that. And then uh, in 95, in July, we heard the news. The Serbs went into Srebrenica and attacked a Bosniak population, which is Muslim by religion, and um, that they did killings, over 8,000 people that were killed at that time. And while Serbs are doing that, in northeast Bosnia, I'm in northwest Bosnia, and I I am a Serb um, by ethnic group. Um, so I don't I have no clue <laughs> why is that happening there. And in my side of Bosnia, um, Croatian army come into part of Bosnia where I am, and they move, or whoever didn't leave, kill the Serbs that stayed there, and that never was reported or never was uh, a big news. So as the child of eight years old, when the conflict started, um, the attacks, which, which were, of course, sponsored by the government, um, came into uh, places, uh, villages in southern Sudan, where I am from. And for my case, I, I was actually in, in the camp, in the Kato camp, when the attack actually entered the village. We were walking towards some place that would be safer with a few elders that were also in the cattle camp. I came back to the village and we could, we could not find anyone. So we walked towards east for safety. Uh, no parents, no other relatives, and no food, no water to drink. The life was tough. I was eating leaves of trees for water. It was uh, dirty water from stagnant pools. Um, and of course, I, I, I saw some of the children and adults dying on the side, um, being killed by the common enemy, or the, the government, of course, or dying from thirst and lack of food and, and again, diseases. We ended up walking and walking and walking, crossing the Nile, finally, and it was months and months. Um, and then we ended up in the border. I was young. So there was probably more to it than I was aware of at the time. It started in a different city we lived in, so it took a little bit of time to get to us. However, our life had changed. They had already put on roadblocks everywhere. We had already heard news of several people killed. When he, our, the genocide started becoming more worse with the city we lived in, luckily, my dad's wealth saved us many times, but it got to the point that he could no longer afford that. Uh, they divided us in groups. We were thinking, if this group gets killed, at least the other one will survive. My father asked one of our cousins to drive us to see if we could be able to reach Congo. Every mile, there was a roadblock. Every roadblock, it was a different struggle. Uh, bodies of people. I, I remember I just, half of the way, I had my eyes closed because either I didn't want to see the bodies or I just didn't even want to see what's around me. Um, houses were being burned. Um, and the, the genocide, our genocide was not even um, guns or bombs or whatever. It was knives. Uh, they had this thing they used to hit people with. It looked like a baseball bat, and they put nails on top of it. And that's why they would hit people either on your head or whatever, they would cut them in pieces. So me knowing that was what, what was going on, I had to block from it. So I can recall some of the things, but I forced myself to black out of it. Um, we were stopped to several places. Sometimes they'll tell you know they'll tell you to go sit down, and they'll put you on a line of how they're gonna kill you again. The money came in handy. What happened to your family? When I escaped from Germany, uh, I came with my mother and father. 
I have no other family. Um, I'll tell you about one cousin who I saw just before I left. She had just been born. She was perhaps three or four months old. Uh, and she lived in Holland, where she, she and her parents thought that they were safe. The records show that my last cousin was killed in the Auschwitz concentration camp at age three and a half, along with her mother, my aunt, and, uh, and her father. You both have a special relationship that ties you guys together. Um, yeah, one of you is Christian, one of you is Jewish, one of you is black, one of you is white. Why do you think um, your experience with genocide ties you together? It's a crisis that, that is affecting humanity. And given that this is about humanity, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter uh, whether or not you are tall. It does not matter whether or not you're white. Uh, it doesn't matter whether or not you are educated. It comes to your door as human being. After Ting and I worked on this art project together, I realized that I was less alone in my, my shell, the, the thing that, that surrounds me. I had met many other Holocaust survivors, and I knew that things were going on in the Sudan and in Cambodia and in Rwanda and, and on and on, but I hadn't internalized it until I actually was uh, touching Ting and, and heard his story and said, wow, we're brothers. We really are brothers. And, and we, throughout the whole world, share an experience. And that, that to me, was a, huh, a, a great experience. As a survivor of genocide, how do you think it's affected your adult life? It's an experience that one cannot erase. Uh, it comes back, and to be specific, I still um, have memories of what I saw as a child. Uh, in some cases, I would have difficulty sleeping at night. During that time, we never had a bad dream at all. During that time, we always had good food, always in the, a place that they have plenty of food, and you eat all day, all night sometimes during that that's a genocide time. But then, when I came here, and the, the dream that I had during that time now became a nightmare. Became like they chased me all the time. They trying to catch me or capture me anytime, and I ran all the time. Why are you sharing your experiences, and, and what do you hope that people will think and do? I uh, haven't talked much about my experiences in uh, Bosnia during the war before. Um, just kind of wanted to move on with my life uh, and worry about things that come up, such as employment, food, things like that, when my brother will have a job. Uh, but I kind of wanted to understand conflicts in general and why conflicts happen and what actually happened in Bosnia, because I was little when things happened. And uh, people ask me why uh, there was a war in center of Europe, why it wasn't stopped. And I don't have an answer. I don't know, I don't know why I had to go through. Uh, I wish I had a right or a voice to say, I don't want to be in Bosnia during the war. I want to leave. Uh, I didn't know that. I heard now, I'm, I'm hearing now that lots of people went to Germany and Austria and um, in refugee camps. Nobody asked me if I want to go because I would. I wouldn't want to be there. And I hope that people will just have a better sense of that conflict can happen anywhere if we are, we are not careful with our actions and our words, and, uh, because it did happen in the middle of Europe. The more we share, the more we feel better. The more I feel that my wound, my deep wound, starting to heal more and more and more. And I still don't heal yet my wound, but it helped me a lot when somebody understands this is what's happening and now what can we prevent it? And that's the ultimate goal we want. I think it's our role to let this world know. So when I talk to people, it's not that it's easy for me to do. I do it because it's educational. And that when people know, knowing it, it's, a power, it's a powerful tool to sort of coming up with prescriptions 
that would then be geared towards uh, preventing future um, folding uh, and folding events. And so does it affect me when I sort of talk to people? It comes back, but at the same time, I, I find it to be useful in communicating it as a way to educate people that don't know. In what ways, if any, did genocide affect your children? My children are very much interested in genocide. They, they grew up hearing about it. Um, there are times when they are more afraid of genocide than I am, uh, and, and I don't understand why. When they were young, I didn't mention at all. But when they are old, I share with them. Sometimes we talk at the dinner table and talk about who was grandma and then who was uh, my uncle and what happened. That sharing moment keep us closer. Our family, even though they are gone, they may be missed by us. And hopefully we all, when we are together, we trying to take good care of each other. What would you like us to understand more about your genocide, your story? Our role as, as, as citizens of the world is to make sure that we are aware of these issues, take actions, and make sure that others are involved. In building your own group and your own self-identity, uh, you got to give respect to other groups and uh, not diminish their value or uh, look down on them or... Um, guess, learn to <laughs> disagree, and, uh, but not in a violent way. I hope if somebody can learn from it and maybe see life differently, appreciate what you have, um, be grateful. You all represent almost 80 years of genocide from the Holocaust all the way up to Sudan and spanning three different continents. So do you think your experiences were similar at all? And if so, how? Well, definitely uh, some of the things were similar, uh, fearing for lives of your family and uh, uh, experiencing hardships, not having uh, food and water and just not leading life. Your life is stopped. <laughs> the only th thing you're concerned with is how to survive and um, hopefully, um, how, hopefully the war will stop. After the Holocaust in, in 1945, when the, war, the World War II was over, uh, we invented a phrase, never again. Uh, and then I met uh, a woman from Rwanda, and I heard her give a speech. And her speech was about never again. And that really scares me that each generation has to invent never again, again. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's horrific. And when will it stop? I hope that at some point, young people will somehow bring the world together and say, never again, and will understand, really understand, in their gut, will understand uh, empathy, uh, sympathy, will understand diversity, will understand what it really means to love one another. Every genocide is unique, and yet all genocides are the same. If we can learn to care for each other, to understand our common humanity, to feel empathy for people as individuals, we won't hurt each other. If we can create the political will to stand up when a country or a group targets innocent people, we can make the future brighter than the past. Each of us has an opportunity and a responsibility to act locally. In our own communities, we can reach out to the strangers in our midst, to act nationally, to contact our elected officials and urge them to take action to protect innocent people everywhere, to act globally, we can travel to other places, read about world affairs, understand what's happening in the world. We can work with organizations that try to prevent and stop genocide. If the 21st century is to be more peaceful than the last one, each one of us must speak up and stand up against genocide.
Children of Genocide, Five Who Survived, is a co-production of World Without Genocide and TPT's Minnesota Channel. Additional funding is provided by Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, STAND, University of Minnesota, Minnesota Interfaith Darfur Coalition, and Diversity Integration Office, Hamlin University, St. Paul, Minnesota.